today I would like to talk to you about technology for health and well-being, but primarily I'll be focusing on technology for mental health, although we do work in both areas. So we've done a lot of health applications over the years. I've been working in this space for about eight years now. Um, we actually started looking at depression and stress. Um, we targeted stress primarily because when you start reading the stress literature and you learn how bad stress is for you, it makes you super stressed out. <laughs> so I remember the first summer I started reading that literature, my heart was palpitating all summer because you know it leads to obesity, it leads to um, heart disease, it, you gain weight in your stomach, you have shoulder issues, back issues, all these bad things happen. So I thought it was a pretty important thing to focus on. Um, and a lot of people understand that stress causes problems, but they don't actually know how to manage it. So everyone has stress in their lives, but most of us um, don't have the healthy ways of coping with stress. We haven't learned them because we really didn't need to as we were growing up. Um, so a lot of people, and they know they should exercise. Um, maybe they do yoga. Maybe you drink alcohol <laughs> to relieve stress or smoke cigarettes. Um, but there are actually really easy interventions, is what we call them, or skills or practices to relieve stress that most of us just haven't learned. So we set out to try to teach people what those are. Now, we started in kind of a funny way. We started externalizing your stress. So we designed a lot of things that you can see here from wearables like um, a vest that has hackles that when you get stressed, it gets really sharp in the back. Um, or little devices you could put on your desk that kind of showed when you were stressed out, um, to even a butterfly that flapped its wings harder and harder the more stressed out you got, which was actually the opposite of the way we should have designed that, because <laughs> it made you really stressed out. We even designed um, wallpaper that got really crankly and ugly and loud and red when you got stressed out in the room. Um, all of these things, these externalizations of stress, were actually not so good. So we moved towards actually putting um, these kinds of skills that we wanted to teach people on the phone and moved away from wearables. And the first application we did was a simple application that just helped people in the workplace learn when they needed to actually um, maybe get up, take a walk, go get a drink of water, take a bio break, talk to a friend. Um, and we actually did this just in time. So we learned when you got stressed out at work and started to recognize that automatically and then automatically sent you a skill to practice so that you would be less stressed out. And people enjoyed that very much. Now we've moved on to doing real psychological interventions or skills that people can practice that come from the field of psychology. Um, we did two different things. One was with psychologists, we learned how to use things people do on their phones anyway. So you're going to go to Facebook anyway, or Instagram anyway, or Pinterest anyway. Is there something there that we could teach you that would help you feel less stressed out? So let's just say from positive psychology, there's a well-known intervention. It's called writing down three things you're thankful for. It actually works. It makes you feel better. Well, if you're going to Facebook, why not go to Facebook and look for three things you're thankful for in your Facebook feed? And people actually will do that. Instead of going mindlessly to Facebook and grazing, um, you can actually go with a purpose. And it actually works. So that was one kind of intervention that we, we learned to provide to people that people were willing to do and that they really liked doing. Then, out of the blue, about two years ago, I was contacted by Dr. Marsha Linehan from the University of Washington. She has a therapy called Dialectical Behavior Therapy. It's a mouthful, but DBT. And it's a therapy to prevent suicide, primarily. It's a very well-known therapy. It pulls from Eastern medicine, mindfulness, training, um, but also real psychological interventions. And she wanted us to put it on the smartphone and give it out to people for free. Millions of people have suicidal ideation or thoughts, and they can't get help. Plus, there are very few licensed therapists, licensed therapists who really know how to do DBT. Um, and people are waiting in line to get this kind of therapy. So we thought if we could put it on the smartphone, we might really be able to help people. Um, we started doing other kinds of interventions. We actually did one application for parents of children with ADHD. Um, it's a, it's a well-known, um, especially for males, young boys get diagnosed with ADHD a lot. It's a kind of hyperactivity. 
Um, and what we did was we had parents wear bracelets. And when we sensed arousal in the parent's bracelet, um, we would send an intervention to the phone and to a display on the wall in the house. And this taught parents things that they had been told by their therapist that they should be doing to model good behavior for their children. But in the heat of the moment, when the child's having a meltdown, they forget. So just by using a simple sensor and the phone, we were able to teach parents um, good behaviors to model for their children. Actually, two years later, um, we've seen that the parents are still using this app. Even without the sensor, they just like seeing what they're supposed to be doing when their kids have a meltdown. So that was our first application. And we, I think the reason it worked so well is because we had really good design. So the interventions or the skills we were teaching the parents were beautiful to look at. And they were beautiful on the display. For the parents on the phone, we actually had the words of what they were supposed to do. But on the wall where the children could see the intervention being displayed, we took the words out. And the parents just had to remember what that intervention was. So the child, who could probably read at this age, um, didn't know that they were actually getting an intervention telling them what to do. And that was quite successful. However, um, as we moved to trying to do this DBT therapy with Dr. Marsha Linehan, we realized that um, just seeing an image and a, and a skill that you're supposed to practice wasn't enough. We actually needed a conversation. Just like when you go to see a psychologist, you have a, a communication with that psychologist. You have therapy, and it goes back and forth. So we moved towards trying to do emotion regulation with a conversational UI. And we've learned a lot about user interfaces for conversations, especially in this area of mental health. So the first thing is that it has to be very attractive. As I said, design is key. It has to be engaging, or people are not going to use it. But secondly, you have to have this conversation with someone you really trust someone who seems very professional. The other thing we've seen is if the agent that you're conversing with is very attractive, that works well too. Um, but in this case, we had Dr. Marsha Linehan. Why not use Dr. Marsha Linehan? She's famous. People who are in DBT therapy really know who she is. She's kind of like a rock star for therapy. So we decided to try using Marsha. So dialectical behavior therapy really is just a way of learning skills that help you cope when you're feeling super stressed out or when you think you might just want to end it all, right? Um, and it's a very uh, systematic therapy. You learn it stepwise. So we had to design the application in a similar way, just like if you were going through the therapy. So that's what we did. And it's really just all about learning the skills step by step. And it starts with mindfulness, and then it goes to emotion regulation. And then there are addiction skills and other kinds of skills. And the good and the bad, as I said before, is it works really, really well. It's well validated, you know, hundreds and hundreds of studies. It's worldwide acknowledged to be the best prevention for suicide. However, as I said, it's expensive, so those that can't afford it can't get access to it. There are too few licensed therapists to, to, to work with. Um, and a lot of people who have suicidal ideation are actually embarrassed to go seek help. So if we could put this on an app on a phone that they could have with them all the time, this might be the way to succeed. So we decided to go mobile to reduce these barriers to treatment and put all of her therapy on a smartphone. But her therapy was aging a little bit. So we were very lucky. We got one of Marsha's PhD students, Chelsea Wilkes, to join our team as an intern. And she modernized it using this conversational UI and kind of making the, the therapy wording a little more accessible to younger folks and just to everybody. So it was the lowest common denominator. And we wanted to use machine learning to see what really worked and what didn't. Interestingly enough, Marsha didn't actually know which areas of her therapy worked really well for which people. So if you had borderline personality disorder, which is very hard to treat, were there certain parts of DBT that worked really well for those people? Or if you just had generalized anxiety, were certain parts better? She didn't know. So this was the first time we were actually able to track what people did with an app using DBT and see what really worked for them. So this is Dr. Marsha Linehan. We turned her into eMarsha. <laughs> She actually she saw the app for the first time uh, two days ago, and she said, man, you even made me look good. I don't know how you did that. <laughs> um, and then her therapy actually is in a booklet. And you were supposed to, as in most therapies and with most doctors these days, write down things on a piece of paper before you go to see the therapist. Well, now you can actually just have a conversation with Marta. So on the your right, um, 
you can see what the therapy from the left turned into by talking to E. Marsha on the right. And basically, we weren't using machine learning to do anything really fancy. We just let the, the patient write what was going on with them. We would ask questions, just like Marsha would if she was in therapy with you. You would answer, and then Marsha would say, oh, interesting. So they, she'd put a label on it. So we'd just kind of parrot back what the patient said. And then the patient might do a rating on how they're feeling or how bad something is in the interface, and then Marsha would respond to that rating. So much of it was canned, but we would pair it back a few things that the patient said to make it sound personalized. What we've learned through this exploration is that conversational user interfaces really work. And so this is just a, a look at what happened over the four weeks with all the patients that we had in the study. Um, the hardest to treat, the borderline personality disorder patients actually did improve the least well. The others, so they're in this curve, so the curves are actually steeper if we take them out because they're the hardest to treat. Um, but everyone got better on these um, clinically efficacious scales, which means very well validated, well understood by psychologists scales of improvement. So we had improvement across the four weeks for all categories of our patients. And what we found, and this is my takeaway message, is that it's empowering to have therapy on a phone, but it's empowering to have it with you. So when you're in your moment of panic or your moment of doubt, and you're really having bad thoughts, normally you would have to call a family member or a loved one or your therapist. And you might feel like that's a burden. If you can just pull therapy out of your pocket, go to the skill that you really want to use in that moment of need, and see that it actually helped and it worked and you feel better, you gain self-efficacy. And you feel powerful and stronger. And you believe in this phone app. And you want to use it again. And that's what happened with our, with our patients in our study. So instead of having to go to their therapist, they were able to use pocket skills, which is what we call it, and it worked. And I wanted to say one last thing before I finish. is that you cannot design, it, one size does not fit all. So for every kind of intervention, and you don't need to read the words on this slide, the point is that for every kind of intervention you can design in a therapy app or an app to help people learn positive coping skills, there will be some kind of skill that somebody loves and another person will hate it. Some people love playing games that help them feel better and get less stressed. Other people hate playing games. You need to use machine learning to hone in and personalize the kind of skills that that person needs to learn in their time of need. So you have to have as broad and varied a skill set um, to help these people as possible so they don't get bored and that, that you get the skills that actually do help them. And with that, I will leave it here. OK, thank you.